welcome to this video version of J. Vernon McGee's fascinating commentary on the Gospel according to Matthew. I hope that you'll be just as blessed as I've been by listening to this commentary. This is a very good place to start studying the Bible with us. I pray that it will be an experience that will be life transforming. And Brother McGee states that it will revolutionize your lifestyle and also your home and maybe even your church. Because that's what happens when you study the Word of God. So firstly, I invite you to watch this program. And secondly, I recommend that you read the particular scripture that we are about to study. That is, read it beforehand, and it will make everything meaningful to you. And if the Lord prompts you to make a donation, please send it to oneplaceministries.com because it is they who are making this commentary available all around the world. Now, as we come today to study the Gospel of Matthew, I'd like to first bridge the gap between the Old and New Testaments. Because in order to appreciate and gain a correct understanding of the New Testament, it's almost essential to know something about those 400 years preceding the incarnation of Jesus Christ. You see, after the prophet Malachi had spoken, heaven suddenly went silent. Station G.O.D. went off the air, and there was no more broadcasting. Until one day the angel of the Lord broke in upon a time of prayer when there was a priest by the name of Zechariah standing at the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. He gave the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, who was to be the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see how important this John the Baptist is in the Gospel according to Matthew. We find that a great deal actually took place during these 400 silent years. And although it's silent as far as scripture is concerned, yet in one sense, it is the most thrilling and exciting period in the history of these people who have undergone a great deal of historic transformation. But although this period was indeed terrific, it was also tragic in many ways. World history had made tremendous strides in the interval between the Old and New Testaments. And the internal condition of the tribe of Judah and the tribes of Israel experienced a radical transformation. A new culture and different institutions and unfamiliar organizations arose during this period. And they all appear in the New Testament. Now the Old Testament closed with the Medo-Persian Empire being the dominant power. And also Egypt was still a power to be reckoned with in the world of politics. But during that interval between the two testaments, they had both faded from the scene as outstanding nations because world power was shifting from east to west, from the Orient to the Occident, from Asia to Europe, from Medo-Persia to Greece. And so the New Testament opens with a new world power, and this was the empire of Rome. And we'll consider some of the important dates in order to get a bird's eye view of this transition period. Now, I don't want to bore you with historical dates, but these are things that we need to know and have before us. For instance, if you go back to 480 BC, Xerxes the Persian was victorious against the Greeks at Thermopylae, but then was defeated at the Battle of Salamis, or at least a maritime storm defeated him. And that was the last bid of the East for world dominion. Then in 333 BC, out of the west came that goat which Daniel foretold in chapter 8 of his prophetic book. The goat, of course, symbolizes Alexander the Great. He was the goat with the great horn, and he led the united Greek forces to victory over the Persians at Isis. Then in 332 BC, Alexander the Great visited Jerusalem, where he was shown the prophecy of Daniel which spoke of him, and consequently he spared Jerusalem, which was one of the few cities he ever spared. And then in 323 BC, Alexander died way over in Persia. He apparently intended to move the seat of his empire there. After that, his vast empire, both east and west, was divided among his four generals. Now, Judea was annexed by Ptolemy Soler of Egypt in 320 BC. Then Seleucius, who founded the kingdom of Seleucidia, which is Syria, also attempted to take over Judea. And that became the battleground between Egypt and Syria. So this little country became a buffer state. It was very much like the old-fashioned rub board or washboard. 
And some of you may remember that your mothers used it in a number two tub, where up and down, up and down, she would rub the clothes. Well, that's exactly how these two nations went up and down the land of Judea. Then Antiochus the Great took Jerusalem in 203 BC, and Judea passed under the influence of Syria. And then it was in 170 BC that Antiochus Epiphanes took Jerusalem and defiled the Jewish temple. And he had also been mentioned by Daniel as the little horn of chapters 8 and 9. He has also been dubbed the Nero of Jewish history. Then in 166 BC, Mattathias, the priest of Judea, raised the revolt against Syria. And this marked the beginning of the Maccabean period. I do not think that the nation Israel have suffered more than during this era. And yet never were there ever more heroics than during this interval. Of course, Judas Maccabeus, whose name means hammer, was that famous leader who organized the revolt. Then, in 63 BC, Pompey the Roman took Jerusalem, and the Jewish people passed under the rulership of this new world power, which is where we were at the time of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the way through the New Testament period. In 40 BC, the Roman Senate appointed Herod to be king of Judea. And never has there been a family or a man more wicked than this one. You can talk about the Mafia as much as you like, or the Cosa Nostra, whatever that is. But this family takes the cake. In 37 BC, Herod took Jerusalem and slew Antigonus, the last of the Maccabean king priests. And then in 31 BC, Caesar Augustus became the emperor of Rome. In 19 BC, the rebuilding of the Herodian temple took place, which temple, in fact, was never completed. The rebuilding continued for quite a while, and was still going on even at the time our Lord was born. Then in 4 BC, the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Now that more or less dates that period for us. But during that time, there arose among these people certain parties that you find mentioned in the New Testament, but were never heard of in the Old Testament. Let me mention several of them. Firstly, there were the Pharisees, who were the dominant party. They arose to defend the Jewish way of life against all foreign influences. They were strict legalists who believed in the Old Testament law. They were also political nationalists in their quest to restore the kingdom to the line of David. So what you have is a religio-political party. Theologically, they were what you would call fundamental in the faith. They were way to the right as far as politics was concerned. And then you had the Sadducees, who were made up of the wealthy and socially minded, who wanted to get rid of all tradition. By the way, doesn't that remind you of the situation we have today? Isn't it interesting that the bulk of the rich families of this country are liberal? A strange similarity, isn't it? And of course, the crumbs still fall from the rich man's table. They're still willing to give you their crumbs, but they won't share their wealth with you, that's for sure. The Sadducees were liberal in their theology. They rejected the supernatural and were therefore opposed to the Pharisees. And these Sadducees were very closely akin to the Greek Epicureans, who believed that we should eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They were the exact opposite of the Stoics, and we all have a wrong understanding of them. You see, they were attempting to attain the good and perfect life. But they thought that the way to overcome this base and rude body of ours was to give it unbridled rule over the soul. And a great many people still think that this is the answer today. But the Epicureans had tried it then, and it didn't work. The third group I should mention are the scribes. They were a group of professional expounders of the law, which stemmed from the days of Ezra. They became hair splitters. They were more concerned with the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. And it was them whom an old King Herod called upon to ask where Jesus Christ was born. And they knew the very letter of the law. They knew very well that it was in Bethlehem. But you would also think that they would have quickly jumped onto their camels and hurried to Bethlehem to see him. But they did nothing of the sort. They weren't interested in him at all. 
They were in love only with the letter or the formality of the law. But please don't think here that I am in any way opposed to the study of God's Word. What I'm saying is that there's the danger of not letting it become a direct part of our daily lives. So biblical knowledge can indeed be very limiting. Raw theological knowledge is not enough. The Spirit of God has to be the teacher. And you can know all the facts about the Antichrist and the beast. And you can know a great many things about predestination, free will, and election. But you can merely know these things theologically without them actually possessing your heart. And of course, those scribes fit perfectly into the heartless category. And personally, I feel like sometimes even today, we can encounter such hard-hearted people in Christian circles. It is very important to know the Word of God. That is a very commendable personal objective. But we shouldn't use this knowledge only for ourselves. But we should be sharing it with others and putting it into practice, turning it into the shoe leather of practice. Now, the fourth and final group were the Herodians. They were a party of strict political opportunists. In other words, they sought to maintain the Herods on the throne. They just wanted their party to be in power. And for that reason, they followed the winds of power, which at that time happened to be in the hands of King Herod. Now, at this time, there was also a great deal of literary activity. During the period of 285 to 245 BC, the Old Testament was translated into Greek in Alexandria, Egypt. It was made by six members from each of the Jewish tribes. And that's how it got the name Septuagint. This Greek translation was heavily used at the time. Paul often used it, and apparently even the Lord Jesus Christ quoted from it. Also, the Old Testament Apocrypha was written in this era. These are a group of 14 books that bear no marks of godly inspiration. However, many honest biblical scholars feel that two of these apocryphal books should be canonized into the Old Testament. These are the books of Enoch and the Psalter of Solomon. But today, the legitimacy of these two books is still considered questionable. Now, there is a period that is marked by God's silence. But God was preparing the world for the coming of Christ. And the four Gospels are directed to the four different groups of people in the world of that day. The Gospel of Matthew, which we'll be studying, was written to the nation of Israel. It was originally written in Hebrew and was primarily directed to the religious Jewish man. Now, the Gospel of Mark was directed to the Roman population and they were a people of action. They believed that strong government and law and order was the way to control the world. And a great many think that that is also the way that it should be done today. Well, there certainly must be law and order. But the Romans soon learned that you couldn't rule the world like that either. They eventually discovered that the world needed to hear about the one who believed in law and order, but who also believed that the people needed forgiveness of their sin and the grace and mercy of God. And that was the objective of the Gospel of Mark, who presented the Gospel of Jesus Christ to the Romans. Now the Gospel of Luke was written to the Greek, that is, to the thinking man. And finally, the Gospel of John was written in a direct sense to believers, but also indirectly for the mystical millions of the Orient, who were back then, and still are now, crying out for a deliverance. because the world today needs a deliverer. So to summarize, the religious person needs Christ and not religion at all. The Roman, vis-a-vis -vis the man of power, needs a savior who has the power to save him. And the thinking man needs one who can meet his mental and spiritual needs. And certainly the great but wretched oriental man also needs a savior who will build him up and bring him to a spiritual state where he can worship God in spirit and in truth. So that gives you a bird's eye view of the Gospels. I thought it was worthwhile to take all this time for that. But now I'd like to get our foot in the door to the Gospel of Matthew. It was written by a publican or tax collector. And he was one whom the Lord Jesus had put his hand upon in a very definite way. 
and he became one of his most loyal followers and apostles. And this man apparently wrote in Hebrew. Papias says that, and Eusebius confirms it. And the apostolic fathers also agree that it was written by Matthew originally in Hebrew for the nation Israel, a very religious people. God had prepared this whole nation for the coming of Christ into the world. He came very specifically out of them. For salvation is from the Jews, says the Lord Jesus himself. And a great German historian said that God prepared the Savior and salvation to come from Israel because they certainly needed it, and the whole world still needs it today. Now you'll find that this is a truly remarkable book, and the reason I believe it is such is that it swings way back into the Old Testament, gathering up more Old Testament prophecies, and you would expect that it would, than any other of the Gospels. But it also moves farther into the New Testament than any of the other four Gospels. For instance, none of the other gospel writers, Mark, Luke, or John, makes even a single mention of the church by name. But Matthew does. He's the one who gives us the words of our Lord, On this rock will I build my church. And it's also interesting to note that even Renan, the famous French skeptic, said that this gospel is the most important Christian book ever written. That is certainly a remarkable statement coming from him. So now this converted publican or tax collector was chosen by the Spirit of God to give this gospel primarily to the children of Israel. And this gospel presents to us the program or agenda of God. Now the expression kingdom of heaven is something peculiar to this gospel alone. It occurs in it 32 times and the word kingdom occurs 50 times. And friends, a proper understanding of the term kingdom of heaven is essential to the correct interpretation of this gospel and of the Bible as a whole. So let me make this statement right now, and I make it categorically and dogmatically, that the kingdom and the church are not one and the same thing. That is, they are not synonymous. And although the church is indeed in the kingdom, there is all the difference in the world. The church is certainly in the kingdom, but it's like Los Angeles is in California, but it is not California. And California is in the United States, but it is not the United States. It is only one fiftieth of it. So the church is in the kingdom, but the kingdom of heaven simply stated, and we'll see when we get to it, is the reign of the heavens over the earth. Yes, I know that theologians have clouded the atmosphere around this, and they've certainly made it a very complicated thing. But poor preachers like myself have to come up with a more simple explanation. And this is it. It is the reign of the heavens over the earth. Now that's a powerful theme in the gospel, because the one who is going to establish that kingdom here on earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the kingdom is all important. And Christ's three major discourses that you find in the gospel according to Matthew all concern the kingdom. In it, you have the so-called Sermon of the Mount which I feel is the law of the kingdom. And then the mystery parable in chapter 13 all concern the kingdom. And in all those parables, the Lord uses the term, for example, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a sower sowing seed, or that it is like a mustard seed, and so on. And then you also have the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. It also looks forward to the establishment of the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And this is very important to see. I've even written a book which I've given the title, Moving Through Matthew. And the reason for this is that there is a certain movement of thought in the Gospel of Matthew, which is such that if you miss it, you've missed the whole Gospel. It's just like cruising down the freeway and missing your exit. And if you miss that turnoff, brother, you're in a bad way. And if you miss the movement of Matthew's theme that is in this marvelous Gospel, why, you miss something that is very important. Now today, we won't be talking about the kingdom of heaven, but you're going to find that in this gospel, I make a different division of Matthew's themes. And firstly, you have the person of the king, then the preparation of the king, the spoken program of the king, 
the passion of the king, and finally the power of the king. All that is in this gospel, and I hope to cover that with you in the coming programs. But for now, I'd like to thank you very much for being with me on this program. Goodbye. May God bless you richly until we meet again on this channel.